I'm quietly confident that Matthew's speech will not be taking us to Normandy. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to speak to you all this morning. I um, wanted to start with a couple of general remarks, having sat through the conference uh, so far this weekend, before I get on to the palace letters. I joined the Society in 2020 with the encouragement of my new best friend, Jeff Phillips, and I found it most uh, pleasurable to meet everybody here and be in congenial company in a society of people who uh, believe in something and want to stand up for something. Uh, if this society was running itself at the moment in Hong Kong, where I've been living for the last three years, <coughs> it would be the subject of official attention. What you would find is that certain leaders of the society would be the subject of adverse newspaper articles in the South China Morning Post, which uh, now tends to publish articles so it can pander to the administration in Hong Kong. Several other people on the committee would find themselves the subject of uh, online uh, interference and attacks. You would find um, over a period of time that some people would resign, and they may even resign from their university positions. So Jim Allen, for example, would soon be mopping out the lavatories at KFC, and, <laughs> and uh, we would have him, uh, instead of giving us his perceptive lectures on uh, decisions of the High Court, he would be telling us all about the dangers of the secret recipe of the Colonel. Uh, so that's an impression that I've got since coming back. That sort of um, dictatorship that's developing in Hong Kong is something I don't think we have here yet. Uh, and I think, as Tony Abbott said last night, we should be grateful for the society we have in that respect. But I do wonder whether there isn't a more insidious form of dictatorship, which has occurred to me over this weekend, and that is one where the people are angry and the people are saying things and societies like this society are publishing uh, good papers, well-researched papers, and are making good points about the problems in our society. But we have uh, an administration or an officialdom that doesn't do anything about it. It's a sort of reverse of the Hong Kong situation in a way because it appears that everybody, perhaps not everybody, but a lot of people who get into power, or as soon as they do get into power, don't really want to do anything about the problems in society. So you have people like Will, William Coleman publishing a very good book of essays about the problems in our universities but ministers of education and the media take no notice of it. It's not reviewed by the major newspapers and so on. And also listening to Gerard Henderson yesterday, when people were asking questions, what are the consequences of the Pell case? And we've had three very good books published about it. The answer is nothing. And what I smell when I come back to Australia is fear. I smell fear in Australia, in governments and officials. And that's relevant to my topic because this book, The Palace Letters by Professor Hocking, George Orwell spoke about a class of books that were good bad books, which he actually thought had a reasonable role in society. This is a bad, bad book. Because what it is, is a part of an attempt by some people in our society to generate fear in people who hold positions of power and uh, uh, officials in the government and administration. It's designed to be a shot across the bow of people who may in the future hold the 
Office of Governor General uh, because it seeks to undermine the mechanism that Sir John Kerr used in 1975 to transfer power in a very difficult position when the government was unworkable. So, on to the palace letters. The palace letters uh, were deposited in the National Archives in 1978 by David Smith, as he was then. He was then the official secretary to Sir Zilman Cowan, um, not Sir John Kerr, but he had custody of the, of the correspondence that John Kerr had kept um, with the Queen during the, the dismissal. There are three files. This is, the, this is the second file which has the documents from 10 October 1975 to 3 December 1975, which is the important period. There's 212 letters in the collection, written between 74 and 77 overall, plus attachments. And reading them, uh, they're available in the National Archives website. Reading them is um, a, a quite a salutary lesson. It's, a, it's also going back in time because uh, Sir John Kerr attached to his letters to Sir Martin Charteris many um, media articles at the time and they illustrate the enormous debate that was going on publicly about what Sir John Kerr might do, what powers he had, whether the reserve powers existed um, by professors and academics and also a lot of people who didn't really know what they were talking about. <laughs> but what it, tell, what it tells you is that all the options were canvassed publicly and some of the allegations that are made by, yes? Could you speak up a little, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks for letting me know. Um, it, it, it shows that the, the public were well aware and anyone who had anything to do with it was well aware of all of the options uh, that could be used by Sir John Kerr. Um, the instrument of deposit, which is what the covering letter of Sir David, or David Smith uh, placed with the papers in the National Archives, uh, said that they were personal and confidential and that the wishes of the Queen and the instructions of Sir John Kerr were that they were to remain closed for 60 years. So that would have been 2037. And they were only to be released even then after consultation with the Queen's private secretary and the Governor-General's official secretary. There was a subsequent instruction from the official secretary in 1991 which said that the Queen herself had instructed that the term should be shortened to 2027. So when Hocking, Professor Hocking applied for access to the file in 2011, it was because her view was, her argument was, that these should have been uh, classified as Commonwealth records under the Archives Act. And if they were Commonwealth records, they were subject to the 30 year rule and they should have been released in 2005. So Commonwealth Records under the Archives Act is a record that is the property of the Commonwealth or of a Commonwealth institution. And that word property uh, was the word that uh, distracted the court, the federal court, uh, Justice Griffiths at first instance in the full court. The debate was all about who owned the uh, records, who owned the letters, as a matter of personal property. So the lawyers argued about common law uh, notions of what was property to try and work out whether they belonged to the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth uh, which included the official establishment of the Governor General. When it got to the, now the, the Justice Griffiths and the full court said they were personal records of the Governor General and they knocked Professor Hocking back. They wouldn't release the records. In those um, arguments, nobody, the, the archives and ultimately the Solicitor General, didn't take a point that was available under Section 33 of the Act, 
that you could be exempt from being a Commonwealth record uh, if the release of the letters would be a breach of confidence or if it was contrary to the public interest. Now, people make forensic decisions in court cases all the time for all sorts of reasons, but I couldn't see anywhere that I've read to explain why those points weren't taken. Now, it's quite possible that if you took a point about a breach of confidence or that there was some public interest immunity for keeping the records back because they were about confidential communications at a level of government that should be kept confidential, a sort of public interest immunity, that that might have been knocked back by the courts because by the time the decision was made, it was really a matter of them being of historical interest only and they didn't really have anything in them that would necessarily be a problem for government. Um, but if the point had been run, it might have at least established through the courts a principle about whether or not these records should attract such sort of immunity or, or be considered confidential, at least for a period of time. And the reason why that might be important is because under Section 56 of the Archives Act, the minister, whoever is the minister for archives, uh, has a power to force public access uh, for, the, for, for records. And so one might get a situation if we had another constitutional crisis where uh, despite uh, after it's happened or immediately after it's happened, uh, a politician may make a decision to immediately have these records released, which would um, just tend to, well, it could be for all sorts of reasons. It could be for political reasons. It could be to embarrass the Governor General or the Queen. One can imagine the um, future Minister for the Republic might be interested in having that sort of controversy uh, arise if, if we had another constitutional crisis like 1975 and the Governor General had to exercise reserve powers. So that point was never taken and we don't have any ruling about it. In the full court, Justice Flick drew attention to it, made it clear that no one had raised the point so they didn't, they didn't have to consider it. But I think he was doing that because he was making the point that no one had made the point. And of course that point, just out of historical interest, was a point that was taken by Mr Whitlam, Mr Connor, Mr Cairns and Mr Murphy when Mr Sankey applied for access to the government records to do with the loans affair. And that went all the way to the High Court and they did accept that cabinet papers to do with the loans affair shouldn't be released. Though they did release some other papers. So the idea of public interest immunity or confidence attaching to these sorts of records is not, uh, not, not made for no, no reason. It's obviously a, a, a potent policy that the courts can enforce. So when it got to the High Court, the High Court took a really different, very simple approach. They said the Act is not raising an issue of property. It's not about common law ownership of the records. What it is is about who has the, the capacity to control where they go. And they said, on a simple interpretation of the Act, what property meant was who was the person that actually could control where they went, and that was David Smith. And David Smith was the official secretary to the Governor-General, so therefore the records were the property of the office or the establishment of the Governor-General, and they were Commonwealth records and they could be released. And then we had the book. So when I uh, was following the case and I knew the book came out, I, um, the bad, bad book, I read the bad, bad book and I was horrified to find that Professor Hocking, a professor of law at Monash University, made high, wide and handsome claims about what had happened in 1975 based on what she said was in the letters. Uh, and she made lots of wild allegations about imperial control. She seemed at times not to understand that the Queen is the Queen of Australia, not the Queen of the United Kingdom. 
and that anything that had been done in relation to the letters, and indeed anything that had been done in relation to the crisis in 1975, was, was done by the Queen of Australia. She seemed to think that we were subject to imperial control. But um, you can leave all that sort of verbiage aside, though one has to um, acknowledge that books like this do influence some people. In fact, they may influence many people. And the reason I wrote the article was because I felt somebody needed to point out that what Professor Hocking was doing was not telling the full story to her readers. In a book published by Scribe, which presumably has a reasonable readership. But what were the main charges? The main charges, the more serious charges that are made by Professor Hocking are three. The first is, and everyone would be familiar with these, that Sir John Kerr was secretive in his dealings with the Prime Minister and he failed to tell him that he intended to sack him. He failed to warn him. The second charge was that in October 1975, Sir John Kerr had obtained from the Queen through Sir Martin Charteris an assurance that in the event that Prime Minister Whitlam sought to recall the Governor-General by advising the Queen of Australia to do that, the Queen would delay making a decision about it. The third charge was that the Queen, through her private secretary, actually intervened in the crisis by advising the, the Governor-General about the dismissal, about his reserved powers, and encouraged Sir John Kerr to sack the Prime Minister, which is probably the most out outrageous of the charges. Now, these charges have been repeated publicly and opportunistically by people like Mark Dreyfus, Matt Thistlethwaite, the Minister for the Republic, as um, we've been told, and, and Peter Fitzsimons, the red bandana one, leader of the bandana republic. And, <laughs> Which is, I think, why he got rid of the red bandana, because even the Republicans might have found something resembling a French revolutionary liberty cap to be a little bit too aggressive. Though Peter Fitzsimons has been, who's a messianic character at the best of times, has been saying these things since 2017, even though he hadn't had access to the palace letters. Anthony Albanese is on record as stating the letters provided comfort to Kerr in making his decision and that the palace should have warned Whitlam it was discussing the fate of the government with Kerr. So it was a, the person who is um, running for Prime Minister thinks that the Queen should have rung up Whitlam and told him that they were discussing things with the Governor-General, which the Queen of course would never do because that would be an interference by her uh, in um, the crisis. Now the other book, which is a good bad book, is The Truth of the Palace Letters by Paul Kelly and Troy Bramston. And that's a good bad book because they agree that the second and third charges, that is that Kerr obtained an assurance for, of delay and that the Queen intervened, those two charges, they agree that that's rubbish. And they analysed the letters, much the same as I did in my article, to show that even though there was obvious discussion going on between Sir Martin Charteris about the existence of the reserve powers uh, and its possible scope and some of the history in the Commonwealth of how they'd been used, there was never a suggestion that anyone ever told Kerr what to do. And Kerr was very careful to make sure that he didn't tell Sir Martin Charteris or the Queen what he was going to do. And when you read the letters carefully, and this is why I wanted to read them, and fairly, that is quite evident. But I think the problem is, if you have a, a prejudicial mind about these things, you're shocked when you see in the letters that these things are being discussed at all. And I think a lot of the, the, the shock that 
Professor Hocking expresses is because she's just shocked <laughs> that people write letters like this. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> but there you are. But Kelly and Bramston still have Sir John Kerr in their sights. They still think that he failed to warn the Prime Minister. And they, uh, they have the same sort of schizophrenic attitude towards Sir John Kerr. On the one hand, he's, he's said to be manipulating the Queen and Sir Martin Charteris through the letters. The next moment, he's someone who's taking upon himself uh, a discretion that he should never have had and using it without telling anybody. So you get this sort of schizophrenic attitude towards him, which suggests that there's a, some confusion and some inability just to really focus on what was going on and the difficult position that he'd been put in. I just want to say then a few things about uh, the issues of failure to warn and this um, accusation that Sir John Kerr got an assurance of delay, because they're intertwined. Um, because they're, they're intertwined because the whole idea of getting some assurance of delay is because Kerr clearly was worried that he would be recalled if Whitlam knew or was told that if he didn't resolve the supply question in the Senate somehow through political means, his commission would be withdrawn by the Governor-General. Now, it's not as if the Prime Minister was unaware uh, of that possibility, because this appears in several of the letters. On the 20th of September, 1975, Sir John Kerr wrote, another point of importance put to me by the Prime Minister at Port Moresby was that if I were at the height of the crisis, contrary to his advice, to decide to terminate his commission at the time when the public service, the defence forces, police and so on, were not being paid, he would have to tell me that Mr Fraser would not be able to get supply either and it would not pass the House of Representatives because new legislation would probably be necessary. On the 30th of September, he wrote, Mr Whitlam, if he were defeated in the Senate, would ask me for what is called a half-Senate election. I asked him whether he thought that Mr Fraser would grant him temporary supply because you couldn't have a half-Senate election which had to be held in December at the time when the money was running out. It would have been irresponsible to have, for, for the Governor-General to have uh, issued the writs for that when he knew that the money was going to run out. I asked him whether he thought Mr Fraser would grant him temporary supply, so that's why he was asking that, until after such a half-Senate election. While thinking that this might be possible, he was very doubtful about it. He realised there would be a profound constitutional crisis when the money started to run out in early November and from then until such an election in early December. But he says he will certainly not recommend a double dissolution, certainly not recommend a double dissolution of the House of Representatives and the Senate. On the contrary, he would call for a vote of confidence from the House of Representatives and argue to me that he's entitled to retain his commission for as long as he holds the confidence of the House of Representatives, despite his failure to obtain supply. So Whitlam was well aware of this possibility and he was thinking up stratagems to, to get around it. On the 20th of October, he intends to produce a situation in which anyone owed money by the Commonwealth, public servants, police, troops, contractors and so on, can be lent by the banks the amount owed backed by a Commonwealth guarantee. There will be no real constitutional crisis because despite denial of supply, he will still be able to govern and there will be no excuse for me to demand evidence from him that he can get supply, and no excuse for removing him and for sending for someone willing to recommend an election. And then on the 6th of November, not long before the actual dismissal, Mr Fraser and his colleagues had come to the conclusion that they would be prepared to agree to a scheme under which the House of Representatives would go to an election at the same time as the Senate election was called. So this was Fraser's a mediated offer to try and resolve the crisis. The Prime Minister said he would never recommend an election for the House of Representatives until he himself was ready to do so and certainly would not do it at the behest of Mr Fraser or the Senate. He later said the only way in which an election for the House could occur 
would be if I dismissed him. And that last line, Sir John Kerr put in the letter of dismissal that he handed to Whitlam on the 11th of November. He put that line back to him in the letter because that statement, that statement was the reason why this crisis was never going to be resolved by political means. And then after the event, uh, Sir John Kerr wrote, Mr Whitlam, towards the end, as I have told you, whilst implacably maintaining his policy, said that there could only be one way in which an election would be obtained, and that was by his dismissal. He said, if I were to do a Sir Philip Game. And Sir Philip Game, of course, had dismissed the Premier of New South Wales. Sir Philip Game actually did warn uh, the Premier of New South Wales that he was going to do that. Uh, and one of the interesting things about that is that Sir Philip Game and uh, Jack Lyons had a, a good relationship and they spoke to each other a lot and there was a, there was a stream of continuous consultation where Sir Philip Game made it quite clear what he was going to do and the Premier uh, didn't solve the problem and so he was dismissed. So Whitlam was well aware of, of, the, of the issue and anyone reading the newspapers would be well aware that he could be dismissed. Uh, Kelly and Bramson say Sir John used the reserve powers in a way that the Queen would not. But there is an important distinction between the Queen and the Governor-General because the Queen can't be dismissed. But the Governor-General can. And this little tripart triangle of difficulty was what Sir John was facing. The Queen doesn't have to face that. In the United Kingdom, the reserve powers are, in a, in a way, hip, hip pocket powers. They're there, they're rarely used, but the threat of them is very important, as Professor Toomey has written. It's all about the threat. But that's in a system where nobody can really dismiss the Queen, and where United Kingdom governments don't behave like well, perhaps until recently, <laughs> like, like Whitlam did, or like the Labor government did. So it, it means that in, in England the powers are less likely to be used, but in contrast, governors general are inevitably in a different position because they are removable and less deferred to by their governments. And those same reasons may be faced a situation where the reserve powers may need to be used and used with skill. And that using with skill is, I think, something that we need to take into account with Sir John Kerr's position. Uh, Peter Boyce, in his book, The Queen's Other Realms, uh, says that a former West Indian Governor-General, Sir Ellis Clark, had observed, a Prime Minister never rejects from his memory the fact that the Governor-General holds office as a result of the political determination of himself or some predecessor. On the other hand, a Governor-General carries responsibilities of constitutional guardianship, which are more likely to require occasional intervention than the Queen herself is likely to face the United Kingdom. So that phrase that um, Professor Flint drew our attention to in section 61, it doesn't just say that the Governor-General exercises the power of the Queen. It also says that he's charged with the maintenance of the Constitution. And this was very much evident when you read the letters. It's very much in Sir John Kerr's mind that he, he has this duty to maintain the Constitution. And he mulls over, painfully at times, what he needs to do and how far he can go in the exercise of the reserve powers to maintain the constitution. Now, Kelly and Bramson accept Kerr's actions were motivated by a fear that Whitlam would have him dismissed. And the, the crucial letter about obtaining delay is a letter of the 2nd of October, where Charteris wrote to Sir John Kerr, if such an approach was made, you may be sure the Queen would take the most, most unkindly to it. There would be considerable comings and goings. But I think it is right that I should make the point that at the end of the road, the Queen, as a constitutional sovereign, would have no option but to follow the advice of her Prime Minister. Now, in Professor Hawking's book, she finds a note that Sir John Kerr made some years after the 1975 crisis where he's misremembered this letter and said that he had got a note or a letter from 
the private secretary saying the Queen would try and delay things. And that phrase is the phrase that Professor Hocking uses in the book, which is not accurate because what the letter said was that there would be comings and goings. And co what are comings and goings? What would be the comings and goings that the Queen could affect? They say that because Kelly and Bramson seem to have interviewed just about everyone who's still alive about this, that Sir Martin Charteris told them that the comings and goings would involve a request by the Queen for the advice to be put in writing, and that this was consistent with protocol. And when you think about it, in 1975, uh, paper still mattered. These letters were sent in diplomatic bags. Sometimes they took a week to get to the United Kingdom. At around the time of the crisis, they were taking a little bit longer because the public service had already instituted cost-saving measures because supply was running out. So the letters were actually taking a while to get there. So it might have been the case that if the Queen said, in accordance with normal protocol, I want a letter, a hard copy letter, signed properly by the Prime Minister, that it would have inevitably caused some delay. And that delay would have been very significant because... Sir John Kerr's power was instant, whereas the Queen had to act through advice and had to go through these protocol steps. But of course, the other thing that the comings and goings involve is those wonderful three things that Walter Badgett told us that the King or the Queen has, the rights to be consulted, to encourage and to warn. And it, it isn't beyond imagination the Queen might have said to, to uh, Gough Whitlam, why do you want me to dismiss a Governor-General that you can't tell me has done anything inappropriate or anything unconstitutional? I'd least like to know and I'd like to know the reason. She had a right to do that. This was the one power she had in relation to the Australian Constitution, the removal and the appointment of the Governor-General. So those rights existed in the, in the exercise of that power for her so that is the basis of the allegation that Sir John Kerr secured a guarantee of delay. But when you look at it, there's nothing really to suggest that there would have been anything improper or anything untoward about what was going on or what might have gone on. But of course that never really happened. Now the famous That's the letter, considerable comings and goings. This is the famous letter of the 17th of October, 1975, where you'll see in this paragraph, Sir John Kerr said, or wrote, before our dinner last night, which was in the honour of the Prime Minister of Malaysia, in the presence of the guest of honour and his wife and Mrs Whitlam, and my wife, the Prime Minister in what he would claim to have been a jocular fashion, said apropos of the crisis, it would be a question of whether I get to the Queen first for your recall or you get in first with my dismissal. We all laughed. Well, would he have done that if he'd been warned? We know that Sir John Kerr said in his letter of the 11th of November after the dismissal reporting on it to the Queen that Gough Whitlam's first reaction to being dismissed was that he had to get in touch with the palace immediately. Now that's disputed, but it is in that letter. We also know that in December 1975, Gough Whitlam wrote to Harold Wilson and said of Kerr, he deceived me, realising, I'm sure, that I would have been in touch with the Queen if my suspicions had been aroused. That seems to suggest he, he would have done it. What did he actually do? What he actually did was later on the 11th of November 1975, he telephoned Sir Martin Charteris. And Sir Martin Charteris reported the conversation uh, in a letter back to Kerr on the 17th of November. And he said this, Mr Whitlam prefaced his remarks by saying he was speaking as a private citizen. He rehearsed what had happened, the withdrawal of his commission, the passing of supply, which had then happened in Parliament that day, and the vote of no confidence in Mr Fraser, which had been organised by the government on that day. 
which had been passed by the House of Representatives and said that now that supply had been passed, he should be recommissioned as Prime Minister so he could choose his own time to call an election. That's what he actually did. So he actually uh, didn't rush off to the palace quite in the way, but he didn't have the opportunity to, by then, have Sir John recalled. But what he did do was he got a vote of confidence to put the Governor-General in the position where he ha had to make a decision whether that meant he should recommission Gough Whitlam as the Prime Minister. But what um, Sir John did was he ignored it. And he actually exercised the power of dissolution. And he, he later reported to um, Sir Martin Charteris that he regarded that exercise of the power of dissolution, which is, which is in the um, Constitution, which says in, I think, section 28, that there are three-year terms, but the parliament can be dissolved um, by the Governor-General earlier as part of his discretion under the reserve powers to make sure that the breaking of the deadlock worked. So we don't, we don't really know, I think, I don't think the letters tell us really whether Whitlam would have carried through his threat or not, but it was a threat that was there. So two um, other comments uh, about the, the, warn, the warning, the failure to warn. The, everybody seems to agree, Sir Paul Hasluck in his writing, Sir Zilman Cowan, that the Governor-General had these rights to be consulted to encourage and to warn. And Sir Paul Hasluck has written quite a few articles about what that meant. Um, in Quadrant in 1983 he wrote an article where he said that the role of consultation, advice and warning can only be fulfilled if the Prime Minister and the Governor-General talk to each other in terms which reflect that they have respect for each other. And that was obviously lacking in the relationship between Sir John Kerr and Whitlam. He also stated that usually consultation, advice and warning would precede any use of the reserve powers. But he conceded that one of the problems Australia has, unlike uh, the United Kingdom where you, we, we've all seen in the Crown, the regular weekly meetings that happen between the Prime Minister and the Queen, that doesn't happen generally in Australia. Um, sometimes governors don't see premiers or prime ministers very often at all. And Whitlam, during the crisis, made it quite clear that he wasn't going to go to Yarralumla to get any consultation or advice from Sir John Kerr. So what really should Sir John Kerr have done? Are there any precedents? In 1948 in Tasmania, the governor, Sir Hugh Binney, tried to persuade the premier, Robert Cosgrove, to resign because he was being exposed in a royal commission uh, as being corrupt. Uh, Cosgrove, unlike Whitlam, put point blank to the governor, if I don't resign, what will you do? And the governor refused to give an answer. The result of which was the premier resigned. So there's someone who didn't exactly make a warning, but he did consult. But if you read the letters, you'll see there was a lot of consultation between Sir John Kerr and Whitlam, constant conversations, constantly talking about it. And they usually are pitched in the way that, as I've shown, Whitlam would make propositions about why he shouldn't be dismissed. And Sir John Kerr would just keep his powder dry, rather like Sir Hugh Binney. And what do you do, because Sir Paul Hasluck makes the comment that these constitutional arrangements do rely a lot on personalities and relationships. What do you do when you have a situation where there's mutual, no mutual respect, really, or at least a good deal of mutual suspicion, such that communication is constipated, especially where there exists a very real counterpower, openly proposed by the Prime Minister to dismiss the Governor-General as a means of frustrating the exercise of a reserve power? So Paul Hasluck said, in abnormal times or in case of any attempt to disregard the Constitution or the laws of the Commonwealth or even the customary usages of Australian government, it would be the Governor-General who could present the crisis to Parliament and, if necessary, to the nation for determination. It is not that the Governor-General can overrule the elected representatives of the people, but in the ultimate he can check the elected representatives in any extreme attempt by them to disregard the rule of law. 
or the customary usages of Australian government, he could do so by forcing a crisis. And I think on a fair reading of the letters, that's what you see Sir John did. After all, if the whole purpose of the reserve powers is to ensure good government and maintain the constitution under section 61, maybe a skillful use of the reserve powers is not to warn. Maybe there is space for that in the rights that the Governor General has. Just a final thing. What Sir John Kerr said after the dismissal about the position, and this is written after the dismissal, but it's written after the dismissal because he didn't want to tell the Queen beforehand what he was going to do. This was his explanation on the 20th of November. I was in a position where, in my opinion, I simply could not risk the outcome for the sake of the monarchy. If in the period of, say, 24 hours, during which he was considering his position, he advised the Queen in the strongest terms that I should be immediately dismissed, the position then would have been that I either would be, in fact, trying to dismiss him while he was trying to dis dismiss me, an impossible position for the Queen, or someone totally inexperienced in the developments of the crisis up to that point, be it a new Governor-General or an administrator who would have to be a state governor, and it would have been Sir Roden Cutler, would be confronted by the same implacable Prime Minister. This assumes there would be no alternative in the Crown's hands, but to comply with the demand for instant dismissal. If the Crown delayed, it would still be here, I would still be here with the same problem, but impotent or with much more serious decisions to make. And I think that that is a fair summary of the position he was in and the reason why he had to act the way he did. Thank you. <laughs>